Throughout its history, China has bent its geography to meet its needs. And it is doing it again with probably the biggest infrastructure project ever attempted. A plan to redirect billions of cubic meters of water a year across one of the world's largest countries. The standard phrase is China has 20% of the world's population and one-sixth of the world's water resources. After the People's Republic of China was founded, there was a recognition that the dry north, uh, where a lot of China's uh, major crops are produced, and also it's an industrial center, just didn't have enough water. And so it was actually Mao Zedong who, in 1952, looking at the country and all the flooding in the south and all the arid conditions in the north said, we should uh, borrow some water from the south. And so he sparked this idea of a south to north water transfer project. With the Communist Party in control, China embarked on an industrialization program that only exacerbated the water shortage in the north. So in 2002, work began on the south north water transfer project, and it's not expected to be completed until 2050. In more recent years, the Three Gorges Dam on the Yangtze River has redrawn the landscape to provide power for the needs of the rapidly expanding population and economy. However, the South North Water Transfer Project is on an entirely different scale. It may be China's biggest and most ambitious water resource management scheme. It involves three major regions of China. You're talking about an eastern leg of this project, a central leg, and then a western leg. They're just a massive amount of water that will be diverted through this, this project. The central route is a canal drawing water from the Danjiangku Reservoir on the Han River, part of the Yangtze River complex. The 1,264-kilometer canal brings water to the capital, of Beijing, and is often called the Grand Aqueduct. The flow of water uses gravity. A series of dams were built to create a head of water to allow a continuous flow. Dumping waste in the canal is prohibited to reduce pollution so the water can be used for drinking and cooking. Construction was completed in 2014. However, it was not without consequences. A third of a million people living near the Danjiangku Reservoir were forced to relocate, and the canal seriously depleted the water running through the Han River. The eastern route, although operational, is not yet complete. Again, this is a canal system, this time diverting water from the Yangtze River to major cities in northern China, such as Tianjin. The eastern route is an upgrade of the already existing Grand Canal, parts of which date back to the 5th century BC. Unlike the central route, the Grand Canal relies on pumping stations to enable water to flow. When complete, there will be more than 20 pumping stations along the 1,100-kilometer length of the canal. Unlike the other two routes, construction on the western route has not yet started. That has a lot to do with it being the most controversial. The plan is for the western route to divert water from near the source of the Yangtze River on the Tibetan Plain in western China to the Yellow River further north. The water would be used in the arid regions of Inner Mongolia, Qinghai and Gansu. However, the Tibet Plain is also the source of other rivers which extend outside Chinese territory, and that's where the problem arises. For example, the Mekong River is one of the largest rivers in Asia and provides water for much of Southeast Asia, including Vietnam, Thailand and Cambodia. Similarly, the Brahmaputra River provides water for India and Bangladesh. The planned western route would draw significant water from both rivers, adversely affecting large parts of Southeast Asia. The western leg is very controversial. Already, China has tensions with its downstream neighbors in uh, Southeast Asia in particular about all the damming that is done along the Mekong uh, River and how that's affecting their water flows into their countries as well. So it has real consequences for populations uh, elsewhere. The government sees the central and eastern legs of the water transfer project as vital to China's economic expansion and security. The sense is it is worthwhile, and part of that is that a lot of the water is being diverted to the center of power in China, to Beijing. So they're supplying 
uh, water to a politically important uh, region that also happens to be an important industrial center and also a source of many uh, crops for China's food security. When completed, 45 billion cubic meters of water will be pumped and fed to the parched north from the soggy south. Moving so much water has raised questions about where it leaves the southern provinces. It's frustrated a lot of these southern provinces, which are uh, concerned uh, about their own water supplies in the face of climate change. And then for the central route, the Hubei province has been particularly upset because it has to maintain a certain level of water in a reservoir in order for this to function. And uh, that uh, means it has less water resources available to its own population. Water and waste from the canals have leaked into local pipelines along the routes. The radical reshaping of the landscapes has disrupted natural ecosystems, especially for fish. There are also hidden dangers in moving water from the country's south to the north, which could have long-term devastating consequences. Particularly the eastern route relies on a lot of natural uh, features, a lot of uh, lakes and uh, other uh, tributary uh, rivers. You're disrupting the natural environment there to move water. Also, you're moving water from the south where there are a lot of diseases uh, in the water uh, northward. A big issue was the concern about schistosomiasis, the, the snail-borne disease that is a real problem in southern China, that that would be transferred north. And there is some evidence that that could be happening. And also, uh, when you withdraw water from one area to move it to another, that can cause things like seawater intrusion. And that is apparently a problem as well. The impact on the population, particularly along the central route, has been immense, with hundreds of thousands forced to move homes. Not for the first time in living memory. That is something that has probably gone underreported, just the problems that many uh, people have faced as a result of these projects particularly along the central route where you already had the Three Gorges Dam construction and the a giant reservoir related to that. Some of the people were moved to make room for that reservoir and then the uh, central route of the South to North water transfer project had impacted them and they had to be moved again. So it's been very disruptive for people and they've had little regress. With construction spanning 50 years and costing close to $70 billion, could other measures have been implemented to offset the need for the project? China has a lot of leaky pipes, and it has not adequately upgraded its water delivery systems to cities. And it, until recently, there was little metering. Uh, water prices were very, very low. Farmers were able to withdraw uh, water with uh, just paying for power and so on. So there was enormous room for conservation policies. They're difficult to implement, however, because they affect uh, Chinese farmers that have the marginal ability to pay more. Uh, and then in cities, uh, when you increase water prices, that's extremely unpopular. So it's been an uphill battle, but it does seem that in the last few years, China has made some headway, but still in a system where uh, transparency is, is not a feature, getting the kind of information that you need to do really effective conservation programs just isn't there. The human, environmental and monetary cost of the canal system has got some in the Chinese leadership wondering about its viability. The former Vice Minister of Housing and Urban Rural Development, Kwa Bao Xing, has questioned whether it is sustainable. With the $70 billion budget and the movement of people, in his view, the project is becoming increasingly challenging to manage, maintain and afford. Some experts suggest the project is just a short-term solution to an underlying problem with the overuse of water in the north and bad water management. Basically, by providing this additional water, you also allow to maintain an unsustainable uh, production system. So I think it's a bit like a surgery option if you maintain the unhealthy lifestyle, but you do a surgery to fix the problem. And I think that's what's more or less done. There is still uh, impacts from uh, overuse of water resources in the Yellow River. And, and by adding this transfer water, you solve some of the problem, which then makes less pressure or reduces the pressure on, on, on 
actual solution to reduce water consumption. The biggest volume of water transferred will probably be used in agriculture. As China's population has grown, so has the demand for food. And to such an extent, the country is now a net importer of foodstuffs. Providing more water may not be the most sustainable way of increasing food production for the hungry cities of the north. The more sustainable solution would be to just not produce as much uh, wheat, corn and other crops in the northern part of China. There's a lot of arid places that produce a lot of crops like wheat, cotton and others that you could produce more efficiently in other areas. As we have heard, one of the significant reasons for transferring water is to sustain the demand from the industrial centers in the north of the country. However, China's economy is changing, moving to greener production and making more sophisticated products further up the supply chain, which generally uses less water. It's not clear to me that the water conservancy projects that China has in place are going to be able to meet possibly even growing demand for water. But so far, those efforts have not worked terribly well. It could be argued the lure of a vast water management project was too much for the Chinese government to resist. The South North Water Transfer Project was an easy option and just another to add to the history of massive schemes reshaping the landscape that goes back centuries. With the hefty price tag, the alternatives such as repurposing rainwater, recycling and desalination of seawater, although expensive, could turn out cheaper in the long run. However, despite the questions over its validity when completed and its environmental and social impact, the project continues and remains one of the largest engineering feats in human history. Remember to hit the subscribe button and ring that bell to stay updated with our latest content. And while you're here, why not check out another one of our exciting videos? Thanks for watching and see you in the next one.